and he will talk about AI and robotic process automation revolution. Oh, it's too long. You tell what you're talking about. Um, a pleasure to have Patrick on the stage. Patrick, it's your turn. Thank you. Here we go. This is one. I'm not sure whether it's working. Can everybody hear me? Is it broadcasting? Yeah. It is? Okay, great. Well, thanks everybody. I'm Patrick Parker. I'm the CEO and one of the co founders of Empower ID. Uh, happy to be here again, see many familiar faces uh, after many years. So, I'm here to talk about how artificial intelligence and technologies like robotic process automation, chatbots, are going to change identity and access management over the next three to five years. Change the products, change how organizations use it, uh, change even what you think the realm of identity and, man and access management is about. So it's exciting times. We're in the midst of a paradigm shift. And uh, one, one example. So how many of you saw Google's demonstration of their new duplex technology? OK, some of you. Quite a few of you. That's awesome. So it's kind of a mind-blowing moment for me. Uh, Google's artificial intelligence a digital assistant able to call and schedule a haircut, call and schedule a, a reservation at a Chinese restaurant, which we know that can be difficult sometimes. And it can handle all the nuances of a conversation and react to it. And the human on the other side was completely unaware that they were talking to a bot. So you know you're on the verge of a paradigm shift when you take everything you've been building, like let's say the, the, the identity assurance, the knowing a user, the verification of identity, the multi-factor, well, and you kind of say, okay, now, how does that apply? If most of the tasks in the future will be done by personal assistants and bots, everything we've been building for multi-factor, for assurance, for user behavior analytics, kind of goes out the window. If, if, if I'm going to delegate to a bot, it's not going to be a human. It's, it's acting on my behalf. So that really, you know, you see that, okay, everything we've been building really doesn't apply. So I'm here to talk about robots, um, not the, you know, this type of robot, but more the software robot. So kind of the, just the history, the origin of robots. The, the term robot in feudal uh, medieval Europe was uh, meant to mean forced work or, or hard labor. In 1920, a Czech writer uh, wrote a play, Rossum's Universal Robots, where for the first time we had a robot as a manufactured uh, being. And they even had a robot uprising. So the first start of all of this dystopian sci-fi novels that we all love today. So in popular society, we have the friendly robots that do work for us. Everybody loves uh, C-3PO and R2-D2. We have the bad robots that are usually the enemies that uh, we're fighting against. So, and, and then, so what are the real robots today? What are the advances in artificial intelligence? What's really going on? So Google, again, Google's really on the cutting edge of artificial intelligence. They have something called auto ML or auto machine learning. And recently they tested it to where auto machine learning actually is machine learning that writes its own machine learning. So it, it, it's AI that programs AI. And they, the recent results was they programmed auto ML wrote an AI to recognize images. And it was actually 4% more accurate than its human peers who are working on AI to recognize images. So we've reached a point where the AI is more, uh, better at writing AI than the human beings who write AI. Uh, another one that just blew my mind was that scientists have been trying to solve for 120 years how when you cut a flatworm, a planarian, how it can regenerate its body parts. Tons of scientific literature, intensive study, so scientists at Tufts University said, we're going to stick AI in this, let it crunch and analyze all the previous research, and let it iterate through possible results. And in three days, it solved the mystery. It found, I think it was, what, two proteins uh, and one other molecule that actually showed them how that animal was able to regenerate body parts. So the implications for medical science are, are vast. So some of the not so good advances, uh, you know, humans bring their biases and their bad habits with them. Uh, recent robot where it could do machine learning, but they were still kind of treating the robot very condescendingly and teaching it things that weren't appropriate. So all of these, you know, the, the artificial intelligence, the big scare with Google Duplex, how do you know it's a human being? What are the ethics of having an AI operate on your behalf? How? independent can it be? How much under your control does it need to be? And do you need to reveal that they're dealing with an AI and not a human being? So 
the ability of these robots has led to, you know, in popular culture, a, a big job scare that, you know, at some point in the future, uh, none of us will have jobs. Uh, the elite will live in a little bubble. Everybody will be outside, and, and uh, all the work will be done by robots. So, and it is hard to compete with a robot. Uh, Capgemini study, you know, a robot can work 24-7. It can parallel process. It never needs a vacation. It never needs a raise. And the cost of a robot is dramatically less than even offshoring. So offshoring is probably one of the areas that have the, the biggest initial impact and, and actually is, is happening today in the financial services industry and the insurance industry. So this is not our first scare. There have been many scares going back. You know, the Luddites is a famous one where they destroyed the looms and the presses. Um, there was a scare in agriculture in the United States in the early 1900s. At that point, farm work was a major profession. There were 30 million people employed in the United States doing uh, manual agricultural work. So with the automation and the invention of uh, farm machinery, there was a big scare that they were all going to lose their jobs. And actually, th the uh, farm employment dropped. In 1900 to 1990, it went from 30 million to 3 million. So in the, the population tripled. So, th so there was about a 99% loss in farm labor. But during that same period, the average employment grew. So there wasn't, although all of these people lost their employment in farms, they actually shifted. And society took that as an advantage. More people were fed, better standards of living. And one of the things that society did was that they instituted manda mandatory schooling. So since there weren't jobs on the farm, those, uh, those children now would go to school to learn to do the new ways of work. So there's a lot of kind of robot angst out there, you know, humans saying, well, what can't a robot do? What can a robot do? And just this general angst about robots and, what, and how we compete with them. So a good article by Harvard Business Review was thinking through, so in the future, how will work change? Is it as simple as everybody says that, you know, we're, some jobs will be completely replaced by robots? Or is there a more complex story? What do the business leaders need to know, and how do they need to think about it to take advantage and transform their organizations using artificial intelligence and bots? So one of the things they said was that you have to cut through the hype. Too much hype. Uh, you know, technology is a very fashionable industry. There's always a lot of hype about the latest technology. So you have to look at it very practically. And what they found is that the jobs themselves would not be replaced. Instead, if you think about a job almost like a supply chain with different parties involved or different tasks involved to produce an end result, you just have to deconstruct the job and say, okay, which parts of this process can be most efficiently done by whom or by what? So looking at a different part of the process, some of it will be human-driven. It needs our intuition, our creativity. It needs our judgment. Some of it's just manual drudgery that does not make sense for a human. So you can, you can optimize a process by deconstructing it into its parts and outsourcing those parts to the most capable parties, whether they're inside the organization as humans or artificial intelligence or software or whether they're outside the organization. So the organization itself is to produce a good or a service, and how it assembles that, it's a capital source that assembles all the appropriate resources, has a better business process to deliver a better product at a better price, using whatever means are most efficient along the way. So the, the main thing that they found was that thinking about replacing jobs was the major barrier to leveraging this technology. Really, you have to look at a process, look at your onboarding process, your joiner process, your mover process, your lever process, and say, at which points do we really need human intervention, and which points could a, a non-human or artificial intelligence eliminate the step or perform the step for us? So you cut down the cycle time, you cut down the cost, and you optimize the process. So if you look at it, instead of it being the total work is being replaced, it's more like a relay race, where at some point in the relay, it's a human being running and doing the task. They're handing off to an artificial intelligence to do the next step, and then maybe back to a human. So it's, it's a mesh of a, a process being quicker, faster, and allowing a human being to do more, produce more output to be in control of more processes than they could if they were involved at every step in the way. So we'll either be assisted by robots at different steps in the process, and then even the, the steps in the process that we do, we will be augmented. So we'll have more intelligence. Uh, one recent example I heard from a, a person working in robotic process automation is that when the cable TV repairman shows up at your house, they hit a button, 
and there's a robotic process automation that goes and scans all the systems. It, get, it interrogates all of your devices in your home, it interrogates your bill, it gets all the information from all these systems, and all of a sudden on their iPad pops up a summary of all the information they could have when they walk into that house. So they know everything about your devices, they know everything about your bill, and they know everything about your problems, all in one instantaneous step. So that way the human's work is augmented. They're going to use that information and their judgment, their experience, their creativity to solve your problem quicker and provide better service, but they didn't have to go do all those manual steps interacting with all those systems. So they were augmented by the technology. So another cap, Gemini. So if you look at a robotized process, basically you're gonna say um, this is an agent entering an order and fulfillment. So at some points in the process, a human being will be interacting, they'll be entering data. At other points in the process, especially when you're interacting with multiple back-end systems, many of them legacy, many of them uh, not an ability to easily integrate to get data from one system into another. And most business processes require you to enter data into many different systems. So then if an API is not possible or if it's cost prohibitive, then a robot can mimic the actions of a human being. They can be much quicker, they can be less error prone, you'll ensure data consistency. So the human enters the data, the robot processes it through the systems and gets a quote. The agent provides their human reviewing. They know the market, they know the customer, they can review the quote. The robot creates and processes the order. If there are any exceptions, so you can have ru a rules engine or even a rules engine augmented with artificial intelligence to see if there's anything else the human needs to evaluate in the process, and then you process the order. So you're cutting down a manual process that might take hours into something that can be very, very quickly automated at lower cost. So one thing to think about is our jobs may depend in the future on being bot whisperers. So being able to better train a bot to do the portions of our work that we do not want to do. So we can, produce, we can work on higher value tasks, we can use our, our human skills and allow the, the bots to perform the intermediate task to produce the results. So each worker will be able to do work quicker and be able to produce more output. Another very interesting study from Harvard Business is how will this be applied? So we know that we're gonna be deconstructing jobs, we know that we're gonna be rethinking work, more like a supply chain, optimizing each point in the supply chain, but what are the technologies from a business perspective that are involved in this? And they broke it down into three main categories, which pretty much fits with um, everyone else's definition. Uh, but one was robotics and cognitive automation, which a lot of people call robotic process automation. It's a technology where the robot is doing the work of a human being, not interacting with systems from an API perspective, but actually entering in the data, just like a human would, be, human would do, taking data in one system or from an Excel file and entering it into the next system, getting the output and entering it into the next system. So it's actually very non-technical, typically programmed by business users and not really programmed, it's more of a training exercise. The next is cognitive insight. So it's using machine learning and artificial intelligence to crunch through large volumes of data, either data on your systems or streaming data or events coming in to identify problems, uh, risks, anomalous behavior, to optimize who should have access to what in your organization, to detect outliers, and things that a human being could never really analyze or ingest that amount of data to produce, but, but AI can be running and churning on it all the time. And then the third one is the uh, cognitive engagement, which everyone's familiar with chatbots. So chatbots becoming the new user interface, we'll see that now. Uh, so, and, and these can all be in combination. So the machine learning or the cognitive insight can analyze and detect an event. That can fire off a chatbot that interacts with the user, interrogates them, tries to assist them. And then based upon the chatbot figuring out what they're trying to do, what's their intent, using artificial intelligence, then the robotic process automation can go do, do the work. So the three can work in parallel or in tandem together. So what is robotic process automation? How does it differ from traditional uh, workflow technologies, business process automation technologies? Again, there's a very blurry line which we'll look at, but the idea is that it is workflow automation typically programmed or trained by business users, non-technical users, and it interacts with applications not by not modifying them, but by performing the actions that a human being would do. Exactly what a user would do on a keyboard, the robot does for them with no human involvement. So uh, there's no programming, and then of course you can apply um, artificial intelligence with this, and you end up with bots that are more mission-centric. 
the bot has an end goal and you didn't necessarily program exactly how it needs to get to the end goal, it can automate, it can learn, it can think to get to the end goal. So what's, there's a blurry line which we'll see. Um, this was from Ernst & Young describing typical robotic process automation. And it's a blurry line definitely for us in identity and access management because you see the typical process across the top, you know, the user requesting from the help desk, it going for approval, the admin team, and then it splits off into the database team, the Active Directory team, and the app team performing the work. And the robotic process automation, the admin team is replaced by a robot, but then each of the, the database team, the AD team, and the app team are replaced by robots as well. Now, in our world, we'd, we would consider those connectors. And a lot of people are using uh, robotic process automation as a, a low-tech connector. You know, it's a connector where you don't have to build a connector to a system or where you can't build a, a connector to a system because every system has a user interface that somebody could type into. So in some cases, a connector makes more sense because the application user interface is changing or there is a good API. And in other cases, robotic process automation is a good uh, gap filler because it doesn't have an API and maybe it's a static legacy app, so it's a better option. So this describes RPA versus workflow. RPA operates at the presentation layer, so again, it's interacting with the user interface. A lot of people call it um, light IT because it doesn't really touch systems, it doesn't modify systems at all. It's just kind of interacting the same way a user would. And then business process automation or workflow integrates at the business logic layer or at the data layer. So it's actually integrating into the back end of, of systems, automating via API. And it's much better for systems that have an API or for bulk processes where you want to send 1,000 users to provision. That might be a, quite a bit slower if you're doing a robotic process automation where it, it's typing. And the two really, I see them blending together because robotic process automation is really just an extension of workflow with the ability to interact in the user interface level. So it's taking the technologies that were typically used for uh, automated QA testing, Selenium and others that drive the user interface for automation testing, and it's making those more user friendly and putting them on a, a workflow scheduler that can run in parallel. So I see the, the two merging together. One key factor, every, the, the, the younger people especially, they only want to type, they don't want to click, they don't want to interact with anything, they want to pull it up on their phone. So the, the conversational user interface is becoming the new user interface. If you can have a chat bot, if they can type, it's very quick to say reset my password and talk to a bot and have the bot run you through and reset your password or to request the bot to send you a link to single sign on into an app or even user provisioning. Well, I have to log into a web app, have to go click to a page, load a form, fill out the information, if I can very quickly just thumb it on my, on my phone. So the, the CUI, you'll see in your user community driving you into being that more of the UI. So your team spent, again, another paradigm shift again, all of this technology to build this perfect UI framework the perfect interactivity, theming, design, and now that's kind of going out the window. You really only want to interact with UI when you want to visualize something, when, it's, you, know, when, you, when you have to. So the, the, new, the conversational user interface is really the one that the users are eyeing uh, and, and not the one that you spend all your time on. So what's the right approach to start? Again, a Harvard Business Study said a moonshot is not your best bet. It's best to take a low-risk approach uh, so, you know, MD Anderson, they had a moonshot project to try to use AI to help solve rare types of cancer. They spent a lot of money. It was too ambitious to, and it didn't achieve it, their initial goals. Now, at the same time, they had the IT department doing simple tasks, helping patients and families, scheduling hotels, helping them have a better experience. Huge ROI, huge, huge cost reduction. Uh, from the employees, from the human involvement, and increased satisfaction and a better feeling from their, from their uh, patient community. They got better service because of the bots. So key takeaways, uh, develop a portfolio of things that you'd like to accomplish, and then pilot. Learn gradually, do pilot, pilot, pilot. They actually get out there and test it. Uh, the, I guess the saying is that you know, you nev no one's ever dr uh, hit oil by drilling through a map. So you really have to get your ideas out there and test them. Test them and see if it's going to work, see if your plan is going to be uh, functional. And I'll skip ahead. So just some things to, uh, yeah, 43 seconds. So where, where I see the future, I see that identity management, 
the overlap of identity management with artificial intelligence and robotic process automation, that that's really the sweet spot. That's where the, the, the greatest benefit to an organization, that's what you can use to drive and change, reinvent your organization, change the nature of work for the future. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Thank you. For a great keynote and I think the fastest five final slides <laughs> of all the keynotes. <laughs> um, you, you know, you, interestingly, I had some memories of 3270 terminal emulation screen scraping. Yes, it's the same technology. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's nothing new under the sun, isn't it? No, nope, no, nope. <laughs> so we to speak. Um, so that was something which came up. Maybe we have a quick look. At least there was one question, or there are a couple of more. But um, so maybe the, the second one: Do you think an AI, AI bot can be tricked to break security, and if so? Uh, how will, will it be secured? Can you give a short answer to that question? I would say yes. I mean, we, we had Microsoft had Tay, which was their first chatbot, and very quickly the internet trolls had Tay saying the most racist, sexist things possible. So yes, AI can be tricked. It, it's working on an incentive, and if the incentives aren't optimized to wait against you know bad bad outcomes, then yes, you can trick it. Okay, super. Thank you.